Mangroves are one of the world's strangest woodland habitats. Survival in this mysterious and ever-changing jungle is exceptionally difficult for both plants and animals. This environment does not suit everyone, but many creatures make their home in this extraordinary jungle that emerges from salt water and foul-smelling mud in a tropical atmosphere and under the influence of the moon. And its inhabitants are as enigmatic and mysterious as the environment itself. The moon's invisible but constant sway gives rise to one of the most productive, strange and little-known ecosystems on Earth. Mangroves are tropical and subtropical ecosystems located around the equator. Those in Borneo and Malaysia are among the richest, largest and best preserved. Mangroves grow next to the sea, in quiet bays and estuaries. They are an extreme type of woodland, occupying territories unthinkable for the vast majority of plants. It seems incredible that the trees of the mangroves can live in salt sea water. Very few terrestrial plants can survive in that environment, but the mangroves' amazing adaptations that allow them to live here go even further. We might say that the mangrove is an amphibian forest, perfectly adapted to the rising and falling of the tides. The biological richness of mangroves is remarkable. Low tide is celebrated by thousands of small creatures, especially crabs, engrossed in a bizarre ritual. The males emerge from the mud and begin their extraordinary claw dance. Thus, they mark their territory and attract a mate. For fiddler crabs, it is clear that size matters. The male with the largest claw is more likely to maintain its territory and so reproduce. But it is not always enough just to show off your size. Male crabs sometimes engage in balletic displays of prowess to decide who's in charge. But the dance lasts only until the tide returns to swallow the floor of the mangrove. The crabs then bury themselves in tunnels in the mud. The fauna of the mangrove must flee the neighborhood for the next few hours. All the animals that live here do so at the mercy of the moon and its tides. Their lives follow the lunar cycle and the rhythm of the sea.
some of the mangrove's most stalwart inhabitants take refuge inland, waiting for both the tide and the heat to drop. On the hills overlooking the mangrove, the air is cooler. Proboscis monkeys spend much of their time dozing in the branches. Their digestion is slow and heavy. They'll not move again until evening. Not far away, on the lower branches, crab-eating or long-tailed macaques also take a break. It is a time for strengthening the bonds of the tribe, for relaxing and even taking a siesta. Grooming rituals have both a calming effect and also help maintain friendships and alliances. Monkeys that groom together will support each other in cases of conflict with other group members. The elegant and agile langurs or lutos also rest in the woodland near the mangroves. This is the best time for feeding the young. The youngest family members are a striking orange color allowing parents to find them quickly in cases of danger. But by five months old, they are more independent and their coats become darker, similar to that of their parents. While the tide is high in the mangrove, only birds and insects can continue their normal activities. Small buds are beginning to open, but this bug is impatient. It drills through the hard covering to reach the flower's juices. Bees, however, prefer more traditional methods. They wait for the flowers to unfold to feed on the nectar. And in doing so, they contribute to the pollination of this unique forest. Thanks to their efforts, the fruits of the mangroves will claim new territories from the sea. As time passes, the sea begins to retreat. and the muddy mangrove floor is exposed to the air. Playfully moving around the water's edge is one of the strangest fish on the planet. Spending more time out of the water than submerged, the mudskipper. In this mysterious forest, everything seems to be a contradiction. 
trees with roots in the air and fish that live out of water. Mudskippers can be found throughout the mangroves of the Indo-Pacific seas and the African Atlantic region. Their habitat is the mud which the mangrove roots hold in place. They move using their two pairs of pectoral fins, adapted so as to become almost legs. These fins are reinforced with very strong muscles that allow them to climb roots and move rapidly across the ground. But this is not their only adaptation. They have large, bulging, mobile eyes, exceptional among fish. As they are on the top of their heads, their vision is very similar to that of terrestrial vertebrates. And they can see perfectly both in and out of the water. Mudskippers have special folds of skin for retaining water. When out of the sea, they periodically contract their eyes to moisten them with the water stored in these folds. This adaptation to terrestrial life is unique among fish. While they jump around the mud newly revealed by the tide, it seems that a few drops from above are the portent of a terrible tropical storm. But no, it's just a false alarm. Proboscis monkeys urinate after their nap. Relieved and now carrying less weight, they leisurely jump through the branches, heading towards the appetizing mangrove trees. The heavier males will think twice before moving their huge bellies. Silvery Lutungs, quicker and more agile than their cousins, the proboscis monkeys, have already made their way into the upper mangroves. They usually investigate the boundary line between beach and trees, where vines and freshwater rivulets abound. These silver leaf monkeys feed on vegetables, especially mangrove leaves and other fibrous plant matter. But they also eat fruits, seeds and flowers. Their sharp, ridged teeth are designed for tearing and chewing even the oldest and toughest leaves. Thanks to these adaptations, they can live in forests that other Langer species without such adaptations would be unable to inhabit, as they cannot eat this diet. And so they are spared direct competition from similar species of monkey. In order to avoid predators such as the feared crocodiles that inhabit the mangroves, langurs only rarely come down from the trees.
However, after feasting on salty mangrove leaves, a nice drink is a real pleasure. And some are willing to risk a great deal for a good drink. This baby Latang also wants to drink, but mum has other things on her mind. She needs to eat urgently in order to produce enough milk for her offspring. For now, the little one has to wait. <laughs> Latungs prefer areas that are further from the sea, and mangroves are clearly divided into several zones. With a complex structure owing to their aerial roots, there are relatively few species of mangrove worldwide, only 54, found around coasts according to their varying salt tolerance. Mangrove forests contain many other plant species, such as the vines that the langurs like to eat. All are capable of tolerating extreme salinity and minimal levels of oxygen in the water and soil. Anatomical and physiological adaptations to combat the salt and lack of oxygen are clear to see. Some trees seem to rise on stilts, while others are surrounded by small columns known as pneumatophores. These specialized exposed roots allow mangrove trees to obtain air from the mud and water. The surface of these pneumatophores is covered with lenticels, special pores, which take in air through their spongy tissue. And this magical scenario is the perfect location for ghost crabs. The ghost crabs appear and disappear at great speed, like spectral visions. They also disappear at high tide and appear like magic when the tide goes out. Everything in their lives revolves around the mangrove mud, which as well as being their home, also brings them all the nutrients they need to survive. They spend many hours each day at low tide ingesting and sifting the mud at full speed inside their mouths. After extracting all the organic matter from each mouthful, they make a little ball of mud which they place on the ground. Eventually, Tens of thousands of these mud balls cover the mangrove. But when the tide comes in, the spherical little sculptures are washed away by the sea once again, leaving nothing of the crab's labors. The mud and earth at the bottom of the mangrove are very rich in nutrients, but have no oxygen. Each tide deposits a thin layer of organic material rapidly consumed by millions of tiny creatures. These are the most abundant and are the first link in the food chain. It's the moment the crab-eating macaques have been waiting for to make their foray into this strange forest. They know that there is plenty of exquisite seafood around here. They also know how to find and enjoy a special meal. Prospecting across the mangrove in puddles left by the recent tide, they find some of the most succulent crabs. Macaques learn from experience, discovering the secrets of their environment every time they venture out into the swamp in search of food.
So while youngsters try again and again to catch a crab, the adults calmly savour their aperitif. The excursion has been a success, but it seems that the returning sea is intent on drowning everything. It's time to retreat. The rising tide doesn't only drive the larger animals away. Hermit crabs need to ascend to the highest mangrove areas, even climbing the branches and roots of trees. at least as a temporary escape. Large numbers of mudskippers follow the rhythm of the tides, and now they gather to eat among the small waves breaking almost without force. They gather at the highest part of the mangroves as the tide reaches its limit. A little further up, with the mangrove flooded, macaques and Bornean bearded pigs make the most of the fruits of the nearest palm trees. Any ripe fruit is a tempting morsel. but they must remain alert while eating, knowing that these fruits are highly treasured by other, stronger animals. The bearded pigs drive away the crab-eating macaques to take possession of any food that falls from the trees or which the tide leaves behind. At dusk, the sea retreats once more. Temperatures drop and all the animals return to the mangroves from their enforced absence. This time, the proboscis monkeys are first to arrive. What they really fancy right now is a salty mangrove leaf salad. Ninety-five percent of their diet is made up of the freshest leaves and shoots of various species of trees that make up the mangrove. It's dinner time and they must fill their bellies so the night passes comfortably.
representing a quarter of their total body weight, their bellies are like huge pressure cookers full of bacteria that digest all the plant matter eaten at sunrise and sunset. At his feet, among the roots, apparently dead shells come alive. Hermit crabs now take over the mud. And with their borrowed home protecting them, they look for any organic debris left by the high tide. Some are lucky, and a fish feast is found. This horseshoe crab, a strange arthropod that has inhabited the seas for 300 million years, was left stranded at low tide. And if it cannot right itself, soon it will become part of one of the mangrove's inhabitants' supper. It is a delicacy that is enjoyed only very rarely. Later in the evening, the bearded pigs, just like the hermit crabs have done, will scour the mangrove beaches. Perhaps one of them will find the delicious prostate horseshoe crab. Crab-eating macaques also roam the beach at sunset. The mangrove always has something new for them to eat. And it is they who find the horseshoe crab. Hierarchy imposes a strict order at table and the most powerful females are the first to eat. The youngsters have to be content with leftovers. The mangroves are the transitory home to macaques and horseshoe crabs, wild boar and ghost crabs, fish and monkeys, birds and insects. It is a unique ecosystem, exceptional in the richness of its biodiversity. The existence of the mangroves, these magical forests that depend on the rhythm of the moon, is fundamental for countless creatures that have adapted to the coming and going of the tides. And so, every evening, before the tide turns and the waters rise again, the dwellers of the mangrove seem to look to heaven and thank the moon for its benevolent, creative influence on this strange and enigmatic jungle. <laughs>